Good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Aranda with Graybar, and I'd like to welcome you to Graybar's G2 Talk presentation called Today's Cabling Solutions for Harsh Environments. This talk is part of our webinar series where we offer every month for our industrial customers. We have a great discussion with Belden lined up for you today, but before we get started, just want to cover a few housekeeping items. First of all, if you were one of the first 50 people on the presentation this morning, you will receive a coupon for a free cup of coffee courtesy of Graybar. Also, on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box for the Q&A. Feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation, and we'll address as many questions as we have, as time permits, at, at the end of the presentation. Lastly, our G2 Talks are all archived on graybar.com. So you'll be able to view this presentation and uh, previous presentations um, online at your leisure. And we'll also send a PDF of the slides later, later tomorrow. Uh, we're happy to team up with Belden today. As electrical distributor, Graybar works alongside Belden to provide industrial grade products and technical support that helps customers save time and energy and reduce downtime. You can visit graybar.com slash industrial to learn more about our industrial solutions. I'm happy to introduce today's speaker, Frank Kodatek, product manager at Belden. In his 30 years with Belden, Frank has worked in engineering, manufacturing, sales, and marketing. For the past 10 years, he has been involved in developing industrial cables for a variety of markets and applications. Frank holds a bachelor's degree in engineering from Lowell Technological Institute. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Frank. Take it away, Frank. Thank you very much, and I'm um, very happy to be here today. Uh, today we will be talking about uh, cabling for harsh environments, and specifically on the networking side of the fence, uh, as we are seeing so much uh, going on at this point and we want to make sure we, we cover, um, you know, what is really critical and uh, what are the important points. So we thank you for joining. Uh, this session does focus on industrial Ethernet cable infrastructure. However, you know, much of the information and the principles that we'll be talking about today are really applicable for installation of other cables in the really the broader uh, industrial market and systems. So I trust this will be uh, helpful for you today, and, I, and we'll have... Uh, you know, time for Q&A at the end of the session. But I did want to start out by talking about, um, you know, mission critical applications. And this is one really as, uh, as networking, industrial networking on the Ethernet side really expands rapidly in the industrial segment. Um, this is where uh, the critical nature of uh, the applications come into place. Mission critical would be where processes, uh, the system failure is really not acceptable it entails significant loss of production uh, as well as potentially safety problems that could affect people uh, within the operation itself. So the three critical areas in this would be the signal availability of the, uh, of the system itself, the signal integrity, that means the, it's uh, received as it's transmitted, and finally signal performance, so it's delivered as specified. Those are the key, key points. Um, that are really define what is, um, what is a, a good signal performance in the market. Uh, cable's an important part of that uh, industrial application, uh, and it is uh, expected to be reliable, so we, don't, uh, we, we always talk at that expectation. However, you know, it's a it's, um, reality that uh, not all cable's the same. Uh, there's issues with the, the type of cable, and sometimes the misapplication of cables as well. So we'll want to make sure that uh, we're focused on uh, those areas. So from a network reliability standpoint, it's really not surprising we're spending time uh, talking about cabling and uh, infrastructure when you can see from the chart that uh, from a point of network failure, 35% of the failures are due to problems in the physical layer. So the notion that any cable will do or just uh, or it's just cable, it's really wishful thinking. So, you know, industrial networking cable is highly engineered product that must be processed with precision to meet all the parameters for a high performance network. And this is especially true in mission critical applications where downtime is just really intolerable, uh, both due to lost dollars and potential safety problems. So when we talk about that, there are consequences to downtime and, um, you know, those involved, as we talked about, safety issues, but they also talk about things like intermittent signals, inconsistent performance, 
And those are really uh, problems that are very, very difficult and sometimes seen when those things happen and they're, uh, they come and go. Uh, they are very, very difficult to diagnose. So it's important that a, um, a solid infrastructure be put in place. It also can get reduced service life of the equipment with unplanned shutdowns. And finally, just the cost of downtime. You can see from that chart there that it can be very, very high. And actually, some of the numbers on that, uh, how much is lost per hour, it could be tens of thousands or higher. It could be hundreds of thousands of dollars or higher, depending on the, uh, the, the vertical market, uh, depends on the application, and depending on the extent of a shutdown how much money that can cost, but it can be very, very extensive. So we want to make sure that is understood. So some of the things uh, we talk about, we're we covering the, the principles, and the three principles uh, that uh, on choosing a right table, number one is know your environment. So understand it very well. Make sure you understand the details uh, of the environment that that cable in infrastructure is going to be in. Number two is you make sure we account for the application installation. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, requirements out there. Uh, there are specific customer requirements, regulatory, uh, agency approvals, that type of thing that come into play. You know, we're familiar with those, UL, CSA, uh, TIA for the networking side, IEEE. Uh, then there are specialty applications like MSHA, which is mining approval, ABS, which is an offshore you know, um, uh, certification. Those are all things to make sure we have those understood. And then finally, following the equipment manufacturer's and engineer's instructions. So that could be installation manuals, operating such instructions, that type of thing, to avoid operational failures that could shorten either the equipment or the cable life as well. So those are, um, those are important to keep in mind. Uh, from a standpoint of evaluating the environment, uh, what I put down is a number of points just to keep in mind. Uh, it's good to have a solid understanding of, of your environment, uh, and it's important to go through the points because skipping those or, or shortcutting can really, uh, you know, cause a problem in the long run. You know, things as we talked about uh, that are on the slide, the, uh, you know, code requirements, so whether it's NEC or CEC from Canada, uh, operating temperature, flame ratings, uh, you know, is there chemical, dust, water exposure, wash down environments, um, you know, what is the electrical noise, EMI and RFI, are there vibrations, you know, could the cable get cut, crushed or abraded, uh, will the cable be flexed, you know, sometimes overlooked, we think about robots, but there's other types of movements that could take place as well, and then is an outdoor environment. We actually had a cable installation at one time where we, uh, the installation went well, the product was in place, but the customer, uh, this was months later, called up and talked about they were getting very significant deterioration in the jacket. It turned out that they were, the jacket was being exposed to a very caustic chemical that was not really understood up front. Um, we were able to have a compound that actually worked very well in that environment but the customer had to change the cable over. Fortunately, he didn't suffer any, any downtime, but it was a cost to replace the cable, reinstall it, you know, buy the new cable, et cetera. So those type of things can happen and do happen, and it's very important to make sure we understand what that is. Uh, from a standpoint, just some, a sample industry, uh, this is just uh, some examples, comparisons of different industrial markets and environments. These are broad examples. They probably do not reflect, well, they certainly don't reflect all industries, uh, but the point is really to illustrate the importance of choosing the correct cable design, you know, for the environment. So you can see the different markets, whether it's the power generation, oil and gas, food and beverage, water, wastewater, auto manufacturing, or mining, and you see the different environmental challenges. They have different challenges, different markets, uh, different industries. Uh, that same cable is not going to work in all industries. Maybe that cable is different just strictly because of the jacket, but there could be other design considerations as well. So as you can, you can see from that, that's uh, very critical to do that type of um, evaluation. Uh, as we go to uh, compatibility, 
with the environment. This is another area people un we, we can understand as well. So when you're dealing with the environment, there's, uh, there's really three ways that we see to um, kind of uh, work through that as far as your installation. Number one is enhancements, and that's actually what would be we call industrial hardened uh, design for that specific uh, environment. Uh, that could be a cable design that is industrial grade. Uh, isolation, that's another uh, part. You could isolate it by putting things in enclosures, conduits, that type of thing. And then the separation, it's actually the, the routing of, uh, of cable are really away from problem areas. Many times and most times I think people take combinations. They'll use a, a, an industrial grade product, but they may route away from like a welder that could be a high noise area, or they may run it into a cabinet or something like that. But, uh, you know, the bottom line is, um, you know, use best and good installation practices. A smart consumer for the most effective cable infrastructure um, that delivers the best performance and really the best total cost of ownership is really what we're looking for. So with that, um, from an industrial networking standpoint, um, you know, industrial networking itself has, uh, has uh, really evolved very, very quickly moving into harsher environments, started out really at the controller level, but it's quickly advanced uh, down to uh, the actual devices where the work is done into very harsh areas. So that, uh, taking that into consideration, that's uh, an area that we believe, um, and other manufacturers as well, uh, that um, you know the industrial networking cables will meet, need to be designed for every application in the plant. And that's, and that's uh, quickly starting to uh, take effect. So from an Ethernet standpoint, there are really some critical design factors. Just wanted to bring this up, you know, things to look for. But uh, from a, uh, there's a number of factors that are involved as far as getting really good performance from your industrial Ethernet infrastructure. And some of the specific design parameters, two critical ones we, we look at very closely and just wanted to kind of run through that quickly, but there's two things uh, as far as the cable itself uh, that, um, you know, are vital, uh, concentricity and centricity. So the concentricity is the centering of cable within the conductor, as you can see in that picture. Basically, the wall thicknesses are even overall. It's very important to have good process control when you're making these cables. The number two is centricity, and that's actually the spacing of the, the between the center of the conductors within the pair. And those two combined, you know, provide things like uh, two major, major issues uh, um, with the cable. They, they support a product that has good balance, and that's achieved by the concentricity and centricity. Now balance uh, ensures that the, the signal will not radiate or be affected by noise, so it, it really essentially enhances noise immunity. And then impedance itself, uh, those are a consequence of that. Cable with good impedance has good return loss characteristics, which is um, less signal reflection and, of course, enhances the signal transmission performance of the cable itself. So those are things that we look for among all the other requirements when uh, uh, putting a cable together. So now we're going to go through specific areas of concern. Uh, in an environment, the first one we'll deal with is noise, EMI and RFI, how do we deal with that? Uh, and that's where I think there's some specific things we, um, we, we view. Uh, some of the common EMI uh, environments uh, would be things like running, running next to power cables, uh, electrical motors and drives are very common in the industrial market and very high generators of noise. Uh, transformers. Uh, power and switch gear, uh, arc welders, and robots. So these are areas where, uh, in that industrial environment, they are generators of noise and can actually cause, you know, signal transmission interruption, uh, depending on the intensity of that particular in that particular area. So because of that, we have to watch closely. Uh, we talked about let's talk about ways to mitigate. Uh, we talked about separation, routing cables correctly. This is one thing to keep in mind why that is so important. Uh, if you look at this uh, chart, it talks about uh, 
why that's important. The uh, inverse square rule actually comes into effect on that, which means that uh, by simply moving the cable away from a high noise source, you can reduce the effect on the cable by reducing the intensity. So for example, if you double the distance from the noise source, the noise effect on the cable will be only one quarter of the original intensity. So you get really you know, increments of movement and you can get uh, you know, degrees of, uh, of uh, improvement as far as um, effects of noise on the cable. So that's, uh, that is why sometimes we talk about just the installation itself can really be very effective. Whether to use shield or unshielded cables is a question. Uh, shielded cables, um, you know, typically uh, the area we really recommend is especially in high noise areas. Uh, if you're in those areas, shielded would be recommended. You know, other than that, um, uh, a well-designed and manufactured unshielded cable will really will perform, perform uh, pretty well in most applications, uh, except for that area where you have high or really intense noise. So those are... Um, those are areas, and it's, uh, I think people would prefer to deal with unshielded cable rather than shielded just from an ease of installation. Uh, this is a, a slide that talks about the bonded pairs, and due to the unique design we had talked about earlier as far as centricity uh, and, the, and the issues there, uh, actually the bonded pairs uh, uh, technology does mitigate uh, the effects of noise because it doesn't allow noise to invade the gap uh, uh, in the pairs themselves when, those, uh, when the cable is flexed or stressed or pulled and turned. So uh, that's an area that, that can be helpful. Uh, they do, um, by not uh, allowing gaps, uh, they give a greater noise immunity um, and much stable uh, due to the stable, stableness of the centricity uh, uh, issue with uh, with the uh, design of the cable. So shielded versus unshielded, uh, that's, uh, that's a question that comes up uh, all the time. It's hard to give a hard and fast, this is what it is, this is what it isn't. We can give guidelines, but a lot of it depends on areas we put down in the chart. Uh, we do recommend, really for moderate or really heavy noise environments, we do recommend shielded product. If you're in low to moderate noise areas, uh, you can use, if you have a good, well-designed cable, we found that those cables are quite noise immune and actually will stand up well to, uh, to a moderate amount of noise. So it really depends on the intensity. Um, with shielded cable, you do have the problem potentially with ground loops uh, that would have to be alleviated with uh, termination practices and grounding practices. With unshielded, of course, that is not an issue on ground loops. Shielded cable, the diameter is usually larger. You put a shield in there, whether it's a foil and a foil braid, the unshielded, a little smaller, a little lighter weight. Uh, and then on termination, if you're, you have a shield, there's going to be a little more complication uh, in the termination uh, compared to an unshielded product. So, again, you, know, you get pluses and minus. The bottom line is, you know, if you're really in a high noise area, uh, you know, shielding is, um, is really recommended. And we also found from the work that we've seen that uh, bonded pairs can help mitigate the effects of noise uh, in a suited or recommended, especially if you have uh, mission critical type applications. So uh, whether, whether you use a shielded or unshielded cable, we're seeing that you get an increment, incrementally better noise immunity by using product with uh, bonded pairs. So the next one we talk about is temperature extremes. This is an area that, uh, you know, in the industrial environment you will see, whether hot or cold. Uh, so we, we talk about what do you do there. Um, typically, uh, you know, PVC jacketed products or I guess uh, in, in total, uh, you know, the, the cables, uh, thermoplastic type products, PVC specifically, um, de has an increase in attenuation elevated temperatures, you know, above uh, 20 C. And there's a derating that's uh, put into effect by TIA. Uh, very high temperatures, of course, can also soften, even melt insulation and jackets. So from an industrial grade product, 
what we see is, and this is important to keep um, you know, industrial grade in mind versus a commercial grade, grade PVC. Uh, not all PVCs are alike. We won't go into great detail on that, but, um, but industrial grade jackets that are typically used by manufacturers in the market are designed for use at uh, maybe plus 75C or even higher, um, but you'll have to probably review that with the manufacturer just to confirm that. So uh, that is, uh, that is uh, uh, something to keep in mind because those would be operational temperatures to know. So in high temperatures, when you really start getting to pro, you know, temperatures well above the normal operating temperatures of most uh, common materials, uh, we see that FEP, which is a fluoropolymer, uh, uh, are less affected by heat at elevated temperatures. Not only in, in the fact that they don't melt uh, or soften or degrade as far as the actual um, integrity of the cable, um, but as far as the performance as well. So FEP insulation of jackets, uh, you know, uh, we rate them for, for an area of 150 degrees C uh, from the standpoint of that, that's, three, that's over 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So those are, uh, that's a very, very good material for that, um, that type application. We did some testing on that uh, PVC versus FEP, and we found, uh, especially when you were exposed to heat, uh, attenuation, uh, which is a measure of signal strength, uh, increases, um, and there's a less signal strength at higher temperature. The graph that you see shows how much the signal is reduced. Um, the industrial grade Cat5e with FEP insulation and jacket retains signal strength above the specification line when exposed to heat up to 60 degrees. Remember, there's a derating that comes into place per TIA uh, above 20 degrees. But we're finding with FEP, you can actually go up to 60 degrees and still maintain the integrity of the signal at that point. So what happens at higher temperatures, essentially the attenuation reduces the signal strength and essentially the difference, the distance. So on PVC, uh, that drop off occurs and uh, at 60 degree, you're below the specification line, which means you've lost your uh, lost signal, which means you're more susceptible to noise, and you have to run shorter distances. And that stuff, uh, those, those, that information is, is pretty well uh, defined by TIA as far as the temperature and the derating that you have to go through. So what about low temperatures? That's another area industrial uh, that uh, comes into play. Low temperatures can cause uh, the insulation of jackets to, to get stiff, but also to become brittle. Uh, so extreme temperatures can cause cracking, and that cracking can damage the jacket, which ultimately damages the performance of the cable. Uh, a couple of materials, uh, FEP, again, a big standout there, uh, actually shows the, you can actually get no cracking when bent at uh, minus 80 C, which is 112, minus 112 Fahrenheit. Now, typically in industrial environments, we're finding that industrial grade PVC really covers most of the, most of the requirements. You can get a minus 40 C or maybe even lower, depending on the blend of the PVC, uh, but you need to confirm that with the manufacturer. Just as a reference, a commercial grade PVC is usually rated around maybe minus 20. So you can see that you can actually get um, very good performance out of a standard type industrial grade material to minus 40 C without issues with cracking. And uh, quite honestly, what we're seeing is that probably uh, takes care of the vast majority of your uh, installations. This will go into exposure to oil and chemicals briefly. Uh, we'll talk about that. This chart shows different jacket materials. These we see are the most common materials used in the industry. There are others, but we wanted to talk about those, PVC, CPE, uh, polyurethane, TPE, which is thermoplastic elastomer, polyethylene. Uh, again, we're seeing more you call out the low smoke zero halogen product. That first one is a thermoplastic, but there's now thermoset low smoke zero halogen, which is very physically robust, which might be an interesting product to look at. And finally, FEP, which actually is terrific in a, from a lot of ways, you know, 
flame resistance, low temperature, high temperature, uh, gasoline resistant, very good chemical resistance overall. Uh, in general, the PVCs, the industrial grade, provide a good overall um, performance in the market. Chlorinated polyethylene, excellent chemical resistance. Urethanes, good in flex applications and abrasion as well. TPEs, good for flexing, good low temperature, very good oil resistance. Polyethylene, that's um, no flame rating in that, but really good for outdoor burial type applications. And the low smoke zero hal, that's when toxicity comes into play. Those would be products to really uh, focus on and, and consider. And you can see this, this uh, chart about the jackets. And you can see what on this uh, chart here we've talked about the standouts. So in the red, uh, those are the standout materials in that particular problem area, like oil resistance. You can see, again, FEP stands out really in oil, uh, sunlight resistance, chemical resistance, um, high and low temperature, as well as uh, flame resistance. Um, then you can see polyethylene for outdoor and water resistance, uh, along with CPE. But you can see some of these other products may not be as maybe quite as high a um, performance as FEP, but they are usually very suitable for an application. This is where probably talking with the manufacturer, talking about the environment, they can guide you as far as what the most appropriate material might be uh, for that particular application. Like I said, in most cases, most applications we see uh, are, are quite well suited with an industrial grade PVC. Uh, chemicals, um, uh, we, we talked about it on the previous slide, but FEP, TPE, CPE give you, really give you much more robust uh, oil resistance and chemical resistance than a typical PVC, where PVC is good for overall use. Those are areas where you know, there could be um, higher levels of exposure due to the concentration, due to the time, et cetera. Next, we'll move on to flexing and bending and crushing, and we'll talk briefly about that to conductors for flexing. Of course, you want to go to a stranded conductor rather than a solid. Uh, well, it gives much longer flex life. But stranded conductors, as a caution, do increase the signal loss and, uh, you know, per TIA, you have to derate, and typically that would be only 82 meters uh, uh, on a, a stranded-type cable. So they, they're more resistant to vibration, but you, you need to be aware of the issues with performance. So for flexing, um, you know, robots, that type of thing, continuous flex, um, you know, flexing uh, will degrade a product. Uh, flexing can also fatigue conductors, uh, so stranded conductors can last, in our testing, you know, over a million flexes. And the stranding can change. There could be various types of stranding, finer strand, uh, that can actually last longer. Uh, stranded alloy conductors that we've seen can test to over 10 million flexes, uh, and we're talking about on an Ethernet-type uh, design cable. Um, actual flex life can depend on the construction itself, but also on the bend radius, cycle time, and how you support the cable. So there are a number of things in place to keep in mind. Uh, special application cables for continuous flexing uh, with Ethernet cables are actually now available. So you can get those products are available in the market at this point. Um, bend radius, that, that can be a very uh, big factor as far as uh, how cable performs. Usually the, the, the bend factor, um, as far as um, you know, what the typical spec is, usually is 10 times the diameter of the cable for an Ethernet type cable. Uh, smaller bend radius can distort the cable and potentially the performance. However, there are cables that can withstand that. And again, in, in those special installations, it's probably good to contact the manufacturer. There could be some areas where they can, they can guide you on that. And then uh, finally, just a brief uh, little look at uh, crushing and impact. Uh, armoring is, uh, is really uh, very, very good for protecting cable. The number one, it does provide physical protection. 
reduces the cost of running the product in conduit. So uh, that's, uh, that, that can protect the cable too, but with, with um, armor, you can actually you know, relocate the cable uh, much easier than can conduit. It's good in direct burial applications. Like I said, it's easier to install and reroute. Uh, it is very good for rodent protection as well. That could be an area, other types hazardous locations, and uh, ingress protection as well. So there's areas where that could really come into play. We have this table here that talks about armoring, interlock armor, uh, interlock aluminum, interlock steel. Um, we have a light armor called bell clad, which is really a heavy tape, uh, really good for light at lighter applications. And then, of course, continuous armor as well, especially suited for, you know, moisture barrier uh, in real hazardous class one, div one type locations. And um, then uh, finally, uh, we have a slight word about, uh, you know, tray rating, uh, people running product and cable trays. So there's two types of trays that were shown here in the picture, tray, you know, TC and PLTC. So the TC, of course, is a 600 volt. A uh, tray rated product, PLT is a 300 volt, uh, two different types of cables uh, for that. Uh, typically, most Ethernet cables are uh, not uh, either PLTC or TC at all. Uh, they are, um, you know, just usually run in a uh, communication tray. But there are PLTC cables in the market uh, at this point uh, that, are, that are readily available. And... Um, uh, but there's also products that are rated AWM, and there's some confusion in the market on what the applicability of that is. And this, just a brief uh, slide shows the difference in environment with a 600 volt AWM versus a 600 volt uh, listed TC type product. And you can see an AWM is really appliance wiring material, and those enclosures and that raceway is considered an appliance and an AWM product would be well suited for that. You can see in the cable tray in the installation that runs uh, would hold basically the building power distribution type products, a TC cables in there, and that's where an AWM product is not allowed. So just to clarify how that would work. Now there is actually a product that has been developed that we did that actually uh, does meet the 600 volt uh, TC rating. It's a category 5E product. So um, as a reference in the market, actually there is a product right now that is available for that particular environment. So uh, that's one that, uh, just to keep that in mind. Um, also, Ethernet uh, cable availability, uh, just as we're, you know, looking to uh, come to the end here, but uh, this is a chart that um, I know other manufacturers, including Belden, put together uh, that helps guide uh, your decision concerning, you know, uh, what's the right type of cable for me to run. A lot of times you'll see companies come out with a broad line of cables. Uh, in this case, there's a table that we've set up that talks about uh, what products are oil resistant, if they're sunlight resistant, if they have weld splatter resistance, if they're suited for outdoor environment or burial environment, gasoline resistant, uh, that type of thing, high and low temperature. And that way, well, that, um, that matrix can help you decide and point you to maybe the cable that's most appropriate for that particular application. So those are, uh, those are handy guides uh, that are available in the market and would be helpful to use. From an, from an Ethernet standpoint, um, uh, there are uh, the products, uh, you know, from a products that uh, product line that Belden would offer and other people, uh, there are cables that are really compliant with TIA standards. They're usually all third-party tested, um, and they, you know, and ours meet uh, most uh, protocols in the market. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a wide variety in the market, but here's some typical type constructions that are available. So this would be CAT6 type products. Um, you see a shielded and unshielded variety, but you can see the things that, of what they are, you know, they're all industrial grade oil and, and UV sunlight resistant jackets. Uh, they have flame ratings, typical flame ratings, CMR, 
riser rated, also FT4, rated for outdoor installation. You notice they're rated to minus 40 on the cold bend. So these are, again, typical type ratings you see in for an industrial grade cable. You can see the, the shielded cable is also rated 600 volt AWM. So that's a shielded product used within an enclosure. You know, typically like an MCC, that type of environment would be helpful uh, to use. So for the, the challenges that we've talked about today, um, from the cabling landscape, you know, cost considerations include total cost of ownership. So it's not just the cost of the components, but the cost of owning the cable, the cost uh, that would permit you to have a really a high functioning, um, high value, high performance infrastructure that supports really the, the needs of those uh, computer uh, applications now uh, that control your process, but also for the future. Uh, performance and re reliability, uh, very important. Environmental regulations, keep those in mind. Uh, that's driving behavioral changes. Also, um, keep in mind as we looked at, there's really no one industrial environment. So you've got to really look at your environment very closely. Um, and also the, prop the properties that best meet your particular um, installation environment and application needs to be kept in mind. So remember we talked about at the beginning the key principles. Number one, know your environment. Number two, account for your application installation. And then finally, you know, make sure you're following the advice of manufacturers and equipment um, suppliers so you can be uh, using the product uh, that they've designed appropriately for your particular use. Well, I thank you for your time today, and I think we do want to take some time to uh, allow questions at this point, and, and uh, happy to uh, answer anything that may come to mind. Yeah, thank you, Frank. That was that was a great presentation. Um, so just a reminder for everyone on the, on the phone or on the webinar, sorry, if, if you want to uh, go ahead and use the Q and A box at the bottom and submit your questions, we, we'll go ahead and take this time to answer them now. So we have a few already lined up. And uh, if you're ready, Frank, we'll just go into it. Sure. So yeah. We have one. We have one here. How do you choose uh, the which? How do you choose which cable to use? Cat five or Cat six? Well, that's a that's a good question. Um, actually, uh, it, it's interesting for because the data that we have shows that most systems are really running 10 hundred meg. Are not even running gigabit right now, uh, which would tell us that a Category 5e cable is probably a cable right now that is suitable for most every application that's almost out there. Uh, that being said, uh, what we're seeing, though, is a migration to CAT6 for a couple of reasons. Number one, people are thinking about not only now but the future. They're thinking about higher performance product, thinking about gig ethernet and higher. Uh, they're thinking about bandwidth that's going to expand, the needs are going to expand in the future. Uh, and they just want to make sure that the cabling is suited for that. So uh, I think it's an evaluation of looking at, you know, what you, what you have now, what your current system needs, but also what type of future system requirements you're going to have. Um, so I'd say this um, uh, Category 6 is one because of the, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, greater amount of bandwidth uh, is something to really keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind in CAT 6 that uh, some people don't uh, under, uh, don't realize, actually CAT6, because of the way it's manufactured, actually does give you um, a better signal-to-noise ratio, which means you get a little more noise immunity from a CAT6 than a 5E. So those are the things to keep in mind when you're deciding uh, which way to go. Okay, great. Uh, we had a question come in. What about fiber optic cables for refiner applications? Uh, we have five, uh, well, fiber optic cables, you know, we, don't, we didn't cover fiber uh, in the time we had, but uh, actually they're, they're in, a, um, in a critical part of a, a cabling infrastructure. Um, so fiber, whether it's multi-mode, single-mode, most of the applications we're seeing, quite honestly, are backbone-type applications. Uh, that's where, because you have distances greater than 100 meters, in fact, much greater, it could could be talking about 1,000 meters or so or more. So if you're running those backbone applications, fiber is uh, 
really the primary way to go. Uh, number two, when you're talking about uh, the amount of uh, signal and uh, you know bandwidth, you certainly get that uh, from fiber. Uh, the other thing on fiber, uh, you know, to keep in mind is if you have areas we've talked about noise, uh, you may have areas that are very very intense as far as noise, and you want to have absolute absolute certainty that you're not going to have a problem. Uh, fiber optic is absolutely noise immune, so. There's never an issue with the noise as far as uh, fiber. So distances, uh, backbone application, uh, noise are probably the big issue specifically that would uh, bring fiber into play. Okay, how do you know uh, what cable to choose for flexing applications? Yeah, we, we talked a little bit about uh, you know, the different conductors, stranded versus uh, you know, solid, so obviously stranded gives you better better flexibility. I would say this uh, really depends on, uh, usually that's um, an issue where uh, customers that we deal with who are looking for that type of uh, information are really dealing with flex life, and they usually looking at uh, you know, the number of cycles that, uh, they, that could come into play. So if you're on a robot, uh, C-Track, uh, that type of device with this really continuous motion, we're talking about products we, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, certainly more than a million, you know, maybe, you know, 5 million, 10 million flexes, maybe even more. And on those type product, those type applications, you want to be uh, reviewing what the manufacturers do. They typically have products that um, are applicable at various uh, flex levels. Um, like we said in our, uh, you know, presentation today, you know, we have products that, uh, you know, just copper, some uh, stranded copper uh, would certainly meet a million flexes without uh, much issue. And if you did some finer stranding, you could probably get higher than that. And then ultimately 10 million or more. In fact, we've tested uh, our product, 10 million flexes meets all the uh, Category 5-year requirements uh, in a, a dynamic testing without um, having uh, any signal dropout. So. Again, I think uh, uh, it depends if it's, uh, it's a high-flex, continuous-flex type application, and the manufacturer can usually recommend the type of cable for that application. Okay, great. We've got another one from Brian here. Uh, when choosing shielding, what are the advantages or disadvantages to, shoot, to choosing braid versus foil? The, um, typically on that, uh, uh, the the, the foil will be very, um, very effective on high frequency. The foil at low frequency, so you know some in power applications, you may find that braid uh, would be uh, uh, effective in that if you're in a high intensity, lower uh, frequency type application. So, uh, but overall, most of the, uh, uh, the 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 sensitivity of an Ethernet product uh, foil takes care of most of it because most of the problems occur at the higher frequencies. Uh, but uh, we, we do see in some instances where the combination of foil and braid, uh, because of the varying degrees of, uh, of noise intensity, that that would be the way to go. Okay, it looks like we have time for one more question. I've got one here. How would you mitigate ground loops? Ground loops, yeah, okay. And we, we talked about that uh, when shielding. Um, I mean, there's a few ways to do it. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the most appropriate way is you run uh, potentially a separate ground uh, between uh, you know, your connection. So if you're going from your, your Ethernet switch to your device, uh, one way to do that is actually run a separate ground uh, between those two stations. Uh, that can be done. Um, that can be a little bit um, you know, uh, cumbersome. So the other way that people frequently use, and quite honestly would be, uh, um, would be quite appropriate to do, is you, on a shielded cable, because it's, uh, it's really not a safety shield, it's really uh, you're shielding for, uh, for noise immunity, is you just um, connect the shield at one end, and that end would uh, need to be at the switch end, and then you make sure you don't have the, the, uh, the shield terminated at the device end. Uh, so you'll have to, you know, that could be something when you're terminating your cable or uh, 
when you're buying your um, your cord set uh, or patch patch cord from your manufacturer, uh, you might specify that in that case you would want uh, one that uh, is made with uh, termination of one end and make sure they they properly uh, designate which end that is. Uh, we can do that in our products. I know uh, we do get that from time to time. It's not very often, but um, we can just say we can make a make a cord set with uh, the shield terminated at one end and and make that happen. So those that that's probably the most uh, common way people would deal with uh, ground loops. Okay, we just have one more question to roll in. We'll go ahead and ask it. We have a little bit of time left. So, what kind of coatings would you recommend for undersea cables? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, as far as uh, jackets and that type of thing, uh, that's um, probably not, uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm not probably well versed in that. That's not an area we play in. Uh, we deal mostly in communication cables and uh, low voltage cables. Uh, but when you get under sea, and uh, some of the applications we've dealt with in some of our cables in the oil and gas market, uh, we usually use a thermoset uh, type jacket, and um, and usually uh, from a from a jacket standpoint, it's usually uh, you know a couple of layers, so it's like an inner jacket and an outer jacket that would provide the strength and the integrity of that type of uh, construction. But I think in that case, um, you know, they, they would definitely be thermal set um, because uh, it just uh, allows much better physical characteristics and, uh, you know, especially in uh, saltwater environments. Uh, but, uh, and again, you know, probably communicate, you know, with the, the manufacturer specifically on what type of cable, uh, are you running a signal cable, a network cable, or a power cable, uh, to get the best recommendation for that. All right, Frank, that's perfect. Really appreciate your time today. We appreciate everyone else on the phone call. Um, just as a reminder, the presentation will be archived on Graber.com, so you can watch it again later at, at your convenience. you also receive an email tomorrow with the presentation, the PDF of the slides, and the, the webinar, the, the archive webinar as well. So. Um, thanks again for your time. We hope you can all join us next month for our next industrial webinar. We'll see you next time.